Welcome one, welcome all to Center of Light Radio. Yes, something looks different. I am not in the screen as a live person. I'm trying something new. I'm going back radio style. I like the idea of the mystery. It leaves more of an ear to be open to really take in the conversation. So I want your thoughts about this. I'm having, again, some more issues with my software. So it seems I'm having some drop frames. It may be okay because there is no video. It's just audio, but heads up, I just purchased some new RAM and it's my computer's robust and why is this happening? Well, blessed be, everything is what it is. Welcome to Center of Light Radio, Keith Anthony Blanchard here, strapping on my brother and sister astronauts as we launch for inner space. Talk about inner space. We're going to be speaking with Mr. Ronald C. Meyer, Ron Meyer tonight, about the alien nature of Bigfoot. I usually go into this long thing. I like that kind of thing, you know, but I'm not going to do it tonight. But I do want to say the, how did he say that? I want to capture his words exactly. Gavin Lee Davies is here, and he said the book Midwife is here. Gavin, welcome to everyone, Kelly, Cindy, Debbie. Um, everyone, I'm, I want to get down to my guest tonight. So I want to make a quick announcement. July 31st, 2020. I like the sound of that. July 31st, 2020. Just remember the number, y'all. Just remember when you see me post and you see this book, just say to yourself with a clear mind, clear eye, clear heart, just say 3,500. You don't have to know what 3,500 is. Just say 3,500 and see it as done. I asked that of you. Homecoming, crossing the bridge to the soul. 30 years of my life, work, play, blood, sweat, tears. All my dears is in this 200 plus page package of light. Homecoming, crossing the bridge to the soul. Stay tuned for more information about that. I want to get my guest on the show. I'm going to call him right in this moment. Mr. Ron Meyer. Hello? Ron, are you with me, sir? Yes. Good Wonderful. Let me let me read your bio. Everyone meet Ron. Ron meet everyone. Tonight on Center of Light Radio, my guest Ron Myers. Well, more so Ron. I'm gonna ask Listen, I'm going to ask a few questions in there. I might politely step on his toes if he says something curious enough for me. Tonight, my guest is Mr. Ron Meyer, and we're speaking about the alien nature of Bigfoot. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Ron. Ron Meyer owns a film and documentary production company, Center Communications, directed feature films. He is author of two novels and co-author with Mark Reeder of two other novels, their latest being The Bigfoot Singularity. Ron leads flow workshops, like the sound of that, and is a fifth degree black belt in Aikido and a worldwide renowned fossil collector. Recently, he published a top stream documentary series on Amazon, Amazon Prime about serial killers. Currently, he's producing a documentary feature on the Bigfoot alien connection revealed. He lives in Louisville, California, Colorado, USA. Ron, I did not get a website address from you, sir. If there is one, please feel free to announce that. Welcome to Center of Light Radio. Hey, good to be here. You, Bigfoot, uh, the Bigfoot Chronicles is my Facebook page. Uh, I have a you know a production company website, but I don't think that would be of much interest to your to to your listeners because I do a lot of educational stuff and uh, edutainment since like the uh, the series on serial killers. So a lot, a lot of diverse subjects. I'm I'm very eclectic in, in the kinds of things I produce and write. Being a, um, an artist, a musician, full time is what I do. But any artist, as yourself, a creator, you do media, you film, and all that, and all that. We're open to other ideas. And <laughs> what got you on the path to seek Sasquatch, Bigfoot, the Yeti, this kind of hominid? Um, let's get into that dialogue, sir. I'm very curious. I've never all all the radio shows I've ever done. I've never done one really about Bigfoot, so I'm really excited about this. How did you get on this particular search for this being? 
So uh, one of the companies I produce for is the largest DVD distributor in the country. At least they were when that meant something with DVDs. And they said, how would you, how would you like to do a series on uh, the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon? And I said, oh, well, I don't know anything about it, but it could be interesting. So I signed a deal to go ahead and produce five one hours on the Bigfoot phenomenon. And, and as I begin that process, I, usually what I do is I research and see where I can get interviews and, and maybe find experiences. And I had no idea what, what goes on in terms of the Bigfoot world. I knew it. I knew that it was big in advertising. It was big business. I talked to a couple of people that were account execs, and they said kids love Bigfoot, and it's it's a real marketing tool. So that was the start. And I ended up going to the Bigfoot conference in Ohio. Are you familiar with that? Probably not. No, I'm not. I'm still an infant. I mean, out of all the different arenas one could play in, in this kind of thought. I, I know as much about Bigfoot as someone who kind of leans into it a little bit, but that's why I'm all ears, my bro. I'm, I have never been there, don't even know about the event. Okay, so it's, it's a big gathering of the clan from around the world, and they have a lot of people there who, who come and share their experiences of Bigfoot contact or encounters. And they have guest speakers, the usual sort of thing you would find. And so right away I said, well... Um, let, let me see how many people I can interview and get their firsthand experience or accounts. And I, and I got pretty close to maybe 20 of them, including, you know, the professionals who do this for a living, including, for example, one of the co-hosts of Finding, Big, Finding Bigfoot, one of the long-running series on Animal Planet. And I was, I was very impressed with these, I guess I'll call them contactees, when they told their story of their encounter with Bigfoot. Um, and I've done a lot of interviews with people across the spectrum from, from politicians to top scientists. And I got a real good sense whether they're bullshitting, making something up or telling the truth. And I was very convinced that these people were telling the truth. They, they were, when they told their story, you could see that their body changed and their language, body language changed and, they weren't lying, they weren't making it up, and that these experiences were very powerful for them in multiple, multiple ways. Some of them actually said it was like having a spiritual experience and stay, has stayed with them ever since. Um, many had these experiences early in life and you know, told nobody about it because fear of ridicule, being ridiculed by their family members. Most, a lot of them are were what you might call manly men who were out in the woods quite frequently. Other ones were military people. A wide variety of of contactees. So I was quite excited to say, well, there's something about this that's interesting. And do you do you know anything about the history of Bigfoot? Or not? Do you want to hear a little bit? No, of I, I don't. Um, I was just always fascinated with the idea, and I never once, sir, I never once doubted the existence of, because my intuition is really, really keen. I just knew it was a very real phenomenon, and actually a reality, and so that's why, I'm, again, I'm really excited about talking with you. Um, so the, the Bigfoot singularity, or is this what you're leaning up to as far as the overview of this particular book, or are we still in the stage of you getting <laughs> your your feet and your shoes on? Yeah, getting my my feet, getting the shoes on my feet on the ground. So I quickly find found out that there are these there, there's a wide variety of what you might call searching for Bigfoot activities that people around around the country, wherever there are woods you can sign up and find out and go on what, what's called a typical Bigfoot hunt, which means usually at night with some infrared gear, you go out with somebody who knows the area and you do certain things that you hope will attract Bigfoot. I think most of the time, nothing much happens. It can be scary. You get a bit of nature, no harm done. And uh, this has been growing in popularity. There's even 
there was even a, an encampment of people from around the country in Canada that came for a Bigfoot weekend. It was a family gathering, and, and they would learn about Bigfoot and uh, go out on these night ops, and uh, maybe they would hear or see something. We were filming all this stuff. Uh, we went on, our film crew and myself, we went on one, two, three, four. Four of these, these adventures, Bigfoot adventures, I got what might be called one response that we could capture, which was they, are, they do, there are certain things that these uh, Sasquatch people do that supposedly tell Bigfoot they're there and they want to be contacted. One is to take a stick and whack it on a tree and they call it a wood knock and the other is they, they do whoops. And at one of the places, one of our adventures, we, we did wood knocks, I didn't. And we got a reply off in the distance, and we were in the middle of nowhere. And Let me ask you right there, Ron. Right there. Here, here we are at that moment. You guys are out there banging on trees, doing, crazy. making these whoops. And when you heard that for yourself the first time, what did it feel like? <laughs> well, obviously, as a filmmaker, I was excited as hell to get a response to capture something. So it was cool. Um, but then to make a long story short, after all this running around and talking to people, I came across one guy who said, well, you know, there's, there's another side to this. And that is that Bigfoot, in, in his opinion, is not a flesh and blood, somehow large primate ape type creature running around. In some sense, it's, it's, it's an alien or interdimensional creature. And he, he made a strong yeah. case for why this is so because of the reports of, and, and I had gotten this with some of the contactees. Usually these, these experiences are very short in nature. Uh, they, they may try and track them and they may find footprints, but the footprints generally um, come out of nowhere, go for a little while and then disappear. As so are they opening up these doorways? Is that what they're doing? They're not coming here by craft. But are they are opening up interdimensional doorways? Yeah. Say, say that again, please. Are are they opening up interdimensional doorways versus coming here in a hardware or some sort of craft? They're actually walking through these portals. Is that what's taking place? Probably not even walking, just appearing. So some people have encountered where they appear out of nowhere. More than likely. They disappear into something like an orb. One guy described he grabbed a tree and merged into a tree. And, th and this was a tough-nosed biker kind of guy who you wouldn't want to mess with in a bar fight. Uh, <laughs> and he said, you know, he had never, never even heard of such a thing. And it had an enormous impact and opened his eyes to that, that there's more in this world than he had ever thought. So, I, I, so one, once I... I thought, well, that's that's really cool. I, I was always I've always been interested, or at least recently interested, in the possibility of non-human intelligence, a different kind of way of of dealing with the world that is not the way we think about world. You know, we got that little voice in our head babbling all the time. You know, doesn't we stop. Them. <laughs> it doesn't stop. Stop. Like having a crazy person with you from morning to night. Um, but the. That that's that's sort of one 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 aspect of being conscious of being a conscious being, something that we as human beings seem to be somewhat special on this planet to, to be conscious and have an interior life, and it, and it obviously is all at the basis of all our planning and getting all these wonderful buildings built and the whole technological thing. But it's also in some way drives us crazy if we pay attention to to it too much, as you probably know. And as you know, you, you like spirit, spiritual experiences, and the goal of that is, is largely to shut down that talking little creature and yeah. get a great sense of what... The monkey, the real monkey. <laughs> get rid of the monkey and uh, yeah. finding, out, finding out a greater truth. So I thought, God, this is interesting. I can, if, if in fact Bigfoot is an alien creature, I can use that as a device to tell a story about non-human intelligence. And that's what the Bigfoot singularity is. But I also, I also love thrillers, and so I wanted to, to make this into a near-future sci-fi thriller. And my partner, Mark Reeder, he's a, 
sci-fi buff. He he works for me, and we've done some. He's done some. We done. We did an earlier novel on sacred places, uh, around sacred places, and we we do martial arts together for a long time. Ron, so, uh, because because you have this kind of thought process and you into these things and you know there you you've had experience your intuition is on point I'm sure as to why you have the successes and whatever we, any of us have in our life that's kind of our measuring stick you know we have a a guide that says do this I'm really good at it you're successful we achieve something are you as well well diverse in the spiritual quote things um, other than you know the Bigfoot experience I mean you're, you're uh, being a martial artist, I'm sure you're, you probably meditated God for many, many years. Do you lean into the ET side of things as well? You mean the extraterrestrial? Yeah. So, should I, you know, I, when I was a kid, I, I was fascinated with the possibility of, of alien contact and uh, probably like a lot of kids. And then it kind of dropped away as I got older. So this this has been sort of an inner reintroduction to me. After I wrote the novel, which I can tell you a little bit about the plot later, I thought I, I got to do a movie on this subject. And one, one way to, uh, for me to explore something is to, is to tell a story about it, either in a book, but more likely for me in terms of, uh, you know, some sort of media production. So there's a, there's a distribution company out in New Jersey. I talked to him about what I was doing in and working on this possible feature on the Bigfoot alien connection. He said, how much money do you need to complete it? And I told him, he said, okay, let's do it. So I, I was stuck. I had to do it. I pray for the day someone asked me that question. <laughs> 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 how much do you need? <laughs> so, so here we are. So, so my, my, my initial structure for this was after, after World War II, um, for a lot of reasons, we may have drawn attention to other alien entities, whatever they might be, because we set off nuclear bombs and launched rockets, uh, Goddard launched rockets. And, and, a rate, and, and people started thinking about, you know, top scientists like Fermi and von Neumann, who were part of that, that, um, making of the atomic bomb. Fermi's paradox, he asked the question, where are they? Because they should be here. They might have 300 million year, year jump on us. And uh, so that question has lingered ever since right after World War II. So, but two things happened right after World War II. One is, you know, the world all of a sudden started experiencing all these, these cases of people experiencing and seeing unidentified flying objects UFOs, as they were called, and of course the Roswell incident really heightened people's awareness of it. And at the same time, people started reporting these Sasquatch Bigfoot experiences. So they they sort of developed in parallel over the next uh, what seventy years, um, going through different stages of development. Um, the, there was that period of time when. When there were these alien abduction stories, you know, Oprah was into that. Oprah was yeah, into that, yeah. and 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 it became more common for people to to start talking about their experiences that ranged early in their life to midlife. And so, my idea is that they per, perhaps they they're the same phenomena, and they're coming and somehow coming together now in terms of people who are doing research. So. That was my plan for the movie. See if I could make that thread work. That that these things develop se separately, and now they're merging in, into one sort of thing or phenomena, all paranormal things. And and again, a lot of these encounters now, these new kinds of alien encounters, are described as awakening experiences. They're not exactly somebody telling you what to do, but they broaden your consciousness and what you become aware of. Associated with Kundalini experiences, have you heard of that? Yes, that, that, that's the field I'm most familiar with. In fact, that's what my work surrounds. We don't really per se talk about the Kundalini. We'll touch on it. You know, I'm just, my gig is to activate people and get them in that fire. 
and get them doing something with the fire. Get the fire going, let it happen, get out the way, or get into the fire, let it do what it has to do to you through the hill. You know, that that's my gig. So I'm really, really familiar with that platform and it's it's where my actual passion is. And yeah, and so I began talking to the to a, a variety of new experts and a number of these had you know, told me that they, like you, you know, are open to hearing these people and dealing with the, these these different kinds of alien contact experiences, which are are more openings, and they activate the Kundalini experience and move you on to a higher level of functioning and awareness and performance. So I thought, wow, that's interesting, and. So where, where would you like me to go from there? I'm just taking it all in. Let me uh, ask you this question, sir. I've been watching Cosmic Disclosure for a while. I'm sure you're probably familiar with the show or at least familiar enough to know about it and what they're talking about. Uh, I think it was Corey, whether you know of Corey or not. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that these beings, speaking of Bigfoot and the like, and maybe there are some other offshoots, but let's just say for now Bigfoot, do you think that they are coming here as scientists, explorers, archaeologists, botanists, kind of thing? This is what was said. Sort of makes sense to me. They hang out in the woods. In fact, that's where they live when they come to Earth. They're outside. Maybe they're out there plucking different vegetation, um, looking at little critters and taking them back. So what do you think? How does that sound to you? Uh, I think it's more like they're studying us, preparing us. Well, the number of people have told me, and I think this might be true, is that, and is that somebody who has a Bigfoot experience, they're out there in the woods, they're walking along a path, and all of a sudden a Bigfoot steps out from behind a tree, runs across the road, and sort of disappears. And they try and track them down, and nothing happens. They can't find it. So they go back and say, wow, I had this really weird accidental thing. I, a Bigfoot just happened to run across the road in front of me. So my conclusion, and I go along with some researchers in this area, is that wasn't accidental. That person was chosen to have that experience by whatever the Bigfoot, the essence of the Bigfoot phenomena is, that they're, they're exposing themselves to you and that most paranormal experiences are of that nature there. They're selected and, and geared just for you. And then they may follow up depending upon how you react to them. And if you react in certain ways, they may give you more. Do you, do you think all the different types of Bigfoot, let's call them the Big Feet, the Skunk Ape, this one, that one, the Yeti, all these, do you think they're related or you think these are just completely different species? Or do you think that, you know, <laughs> different types of humans basically come in here and just groups of different individuals? None of those. I, I think that my, my sense is, is that whatever these, these things are, they, they have the capability of, of appearing as fairies, Bigfoot, maybe even ghosts, that, that how they chose to contact you is sort of up to them that they're they're not a species running around they they don't need to eat you know nobody's ever found any scat or or i understand so it's it's not necessarily the skunk it's all that <laughs> in other words they can choose how they condition themselves acclimate to a particular climate location or whatever it takes to get the job done kind of thing yeah yeah they you know they they're quite capable of existing under almost any circumstance and appearing for whatever period of time they feel is necessary for the, the contact. He, I don't think that if there's nobody there to see them, they're not just hanging out in the woods, having a good time, bugging the deer and the, and the owls and so on. So would you yeah. say that because they have the ability to shape shift, like you said, they can look like a this or that or the other thing. Do you think their natural default shape look appearance is the bigfoot itself mm, i have no way of answering that but i guess it understood no. understood 
Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the I have some land up in the Rocky Mountains, and before when I was writing the novel and after I finished the series, we went up to our land and it's it's a uh, we're in holders right next to Rocky Mountain National Park, so it's it's pretty pretty wild, pretty free, and I was up there looking around in the spring with a couple with my daughter and son-in-law and we found these prints in the snow that had that that well first of all we talked to a couple other people that share 40s up there and they all said yeah bigfoot's up here i was like huh how strange is that um <laughs> it's like I had no idea you know before and so we found these prints that came out of nowhere they walked up to this one area that was sort of like an anthill and then disappeared. And then my son-in-law, he backtracked and followed. It's hard to say if they were coming or going, but he backtracked and followed them up one of the ledges to a tree and they disappeared again. It was like, wow, that's weird. So that, that was my first real encounter with something that fits the pattern of what other people have, have seen. Footprints that that emerge from nowhere, go somewhere a little bit, and then just disappear. So, like, huh? So that that was one of the impetuses to to do the movie and look more deeply into the phenomena of uh, paranormal or alien Bigfoot. This is just fascinating to me. Let's take a short pause. I'm going to play a song. Everyone tonight, my guest is Ron Meyer, and we're speaking about the alien nature of Bigfoot. Welcome to Center of Light Radio. Take a lavender soul song break. I'm going to be right back. Welcome back to Center of Light. Keith Anthony Blanchett here. I was just talking to my guests a little early in the radio green room. I've been doing radio for over nine years, and I love it. I still absolutely love it, especially when I get to sit in this chair and have something come across my experience, I'd say, I would say pretty much doggone for the first time. Uh, I I've intuitively understand this particular experience that we, uh, tonight, my guests Ron Meyer are talking about the alien nature of Bigfoot. But I'm really digging being able to sit back and not have to teach, sit, sit back and not take it in and learn something new. And it's still, Again, it, even though it's new and fresh for me, Ron, it feels vibrationally matched. <laughs> it's, it's, all the same beautiful, it's all the same beautiful expression saying, look, here's another guise of what I look like, right? That's right. <laughs> I love it. So before you begin, I, I got to do what my book publicist needs me to do, which is to say, hey, you can go to Amazon by the Bigfoot Singularity. I'd love you to do that. You'll catch up on a lot of these. Even though it's a an action thriller kind of book, you'll you'll get all these aspects, the paranormal, paraphysical aspects aspects of Bigfoot as as the novel progresses, as you see them having unusual powers and capabilities. Um, so you can learn about them that way too through the novel in a sur surreptitious way. Um, but go ahead now. I've done oh, my time. No, no, that's it. I'm ready to listen to you. Let me ask you. I just got some curious questions, and I don't know why I would think that you would know them, but you've been doing this a little longer. Maybe you rubbed elbows with someone who they haven't, you know, they've been doing a little longer, have intuition about such things. Do you think they're coming here to, of, of course, we talked about the, uh, the observance, but do you think they're coming here as uh, colleagues or co workers, or do you think they're coming here as families? Or do they have families in there stay here? I mean, and you know anything about that? The one thing you can be certain of is if they're alien, they're a lot smarter than us. They've been around as whatever whatever sort of lineage they may come from, cultures. They, they've been here, and they're a lot smarter to have gotten here and been messing around with us for probably quite a few quite a few years, maybe, maybe 10, 20,000 years. Who knows? So yeah. they that we're, we're probably not all that privileged to understand their their thought processes, <laughs> their purposes. Right. You know, like, it would be hard to explain to a bear, a community of bears in Yellowstone, and, you know, we're studying them, we're tagging them, 
we're knocking them out, we're adjusting their environment, we're changing their predator-prey ratio. And I think if they looked at us and said, what in the fuck are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. What in the heck are you doing? You're fine. <laughs> You're right. Uh, um, <laughs> Hello. I don't, think, I don't think we could properly explain to them that, hey, we're, we're, we're animal scientists and we're studying your behavior and your relationship to the environment. Uh, you would never make any sense to them to explain to them why we're doing what we're doing to them, right? Totally. I think totally. it's a situation like that. But I, but I do believe that in some way they're preparing us for something something important. Do you know who Stanton Friedman is? Absolutely. I did the last on-camera interview with him for the movie. Uh, uh, you know, he's he was the most prominent UFOologist. And yeah. so I asked him what his opinion was on Bigfoot. And he he, he said they're, prob- they're, they're aliens doing the heavy lifting for some something else that's of greater intelligence and of alien in nature. That was his opinion, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm fortunate enough, Ron, to once, twice a year to be in the physical proximity of a God-realized man from India. In fact, he's very, I don't want to use the word famous, but he is because of who and what he is. This is, we're talking about (laughs) his divinity, bro. And, but, uh, Every once in a while, I'm fortunate enough to ask him questions that he just will not dabble in these arenas because he's busy doing his sitting on the throne thing versus me, you know, me asking him silly, curious, Keith Blanchard questions. But I would love to ask him that question. I was fortunate enough to ask him a few questions about certain natures, certain things about reality, what would be true and what is true and what is not. And he never really gave me the full answer. He, that, that's his job, is to not give me the whole answer, is to keep me uh, engaged. Speaking of engaged, do you have the opportunity, do you still take the time, sir, to get out there in the woods and peek, poke around? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong fossil collector, so I have a, a site up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is deep woods, not many people. And I've been going up there twice a year for six years now. So I'm out there lifting rocks and finding unique creatures that are 430 million years old that people have never seen before. So, yeah. That has to be pretty stinking cool, man. My son would love something like that. Wow. And then it's, it's all a brand new experience every time you do it. There's something new that happens, a different order. You discover something new. It's... You know, I need to retreat back to the woods. My work, fortunately, well, fortunately, I like being here because my son's here, but has been mostly in brick and mortar. <laughs> but I think in the very near future, I'm going to return to nature. Maybe I can come out to Colorado and hang out on your couch. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Um, so, you, one of the one of the things I came across, and you're kind of kind of alluding to this. Oh, by, by the way, I've had a multiplicity of non-dual experiences and. I followed around some, what you might call enlightenment people to see what they're about. Was actually doing some filming for a woman named Sai Ma, who's a quite a spiritual leader. In the, I met Sai Ma, yeah, yeah, I know her. So I, I've been a seeker of these of ultimate truth for quite a while. So I'm I'm, I'm very open to all this sort of stuff. And anyhow, maybe maybe that's. Well, Maybe that's why I'm doing this thing right now because it seems <laughs> things have fallen fallen together beautifully. I mean, for example, I was giving a talk on my fossil discoveries at at the big gathering of the professional paleontologists this this uh, this summer, and I was asked to do some filming for this woman who's who's trying to bring science to uh, the Muslim world. And so I did a series of interviews because there were luminaries there. And one of the people happened to be an astrophysicist who specialized in alien contact. I was like, whoa, that was an accidental. That was meant to happen. And he, he gave a nice talk on von Neumann robots and the Fermi paradox and described all that from an astrophysicist perspective. Just came out of the blue. So when I filmed it, I asked the people who I filmed it for, can you give me that footage? And I'll use it in my movie, and I have it in my movie. Things like that were happening all the time I was doing this movie. So there's probably some bigger force behind it to to 
add this element, which would this idea that these these contact experiences are made for you is something that's new to a lot of people. It seems kind of new to you as well, right? I would agree. Well, my contact experiences, um, my contact experiences, I've been having since I was a child. <laughs> so here you are, doing this. Yeah, um, I honestly, Ron, when I was a young boy. Eight, nine, maybe ten. Between eight and ten, it happened for a couple of years. I would often find myself in the middle of a pitch black backyard. Eight-year-old boys being me, uh, I was scared of dogs. There's no I'd be outside at three o'clock in the morning. Just and I wasn't sleepwalking. But this would be a repeated event. I would find myself in the backyard coming to a state of awareness as if I was just came back there was no fear I was just just came to a state of consciousness standing there in my backyard and I had to and I'm a little guy I'm five foot four and a half so I had to prop up a cinder block to be tall enough to get back in my bedroom and I did this a couple times a week skip a week three times the next skip a week one this was just that real. and I did this for years and about 33 years old I was watching the Discovery Channel and there was some show about extraterrestrials and I had a full conscious recall. And now I consider myself to be an extraterrestrial target. I'm found by different races. I hang out with these beings. They give me messages. They show me images. This happens mm, quite often, actually. And they're, they're very, very light. Very, And I've never been taken beyond my will, not even once. In fact, every experience I had, I was so hyper, uh, hyper lucid real, um, I began to... Den denounce deny this reality because when i'm in those experiences i tell myself ron oh my god i actually have a body somewhere laying on the bed you know gazillion light meters away so this has been happening for me quite a while do you have these light natured or multi-dimensional experiences when you go into sleep yourself into sleep yeah, and that, this is when most of my activity happens. That that door becomes cracked wide open for me. No, my, my, most of my non-dual experiences were, some of them were doing what I what were called light minute, enlightenment intensives, where we were going for that. But I but I've had them spontaneously, but not, never associated with sleep. I do some loose, lucid dreaming, but um, are you familiar? And I have some interesting experiences. During the the hypnagogic state, are you familiar with that? Talk about strange. <laughs> you know that yeah, yeah. That's the main between being awake and and going to sleep. Where it's okay, okay. if you're not stuck in it. <laughs> if you're not stuck, I mean, like frozen concrete. You know, being afraid. I mean, if you find yourself there and you use it as a vehicle to launch, it's great. But if you find yourself in sleep paralysis, it can be scary for most people. Yeah. So. That, that's the closest thing to sleep, but it, it precedes sleep. And I can, I can bring that on if I just want to lie down and and look into, you know, close my eyes and keep keep my vision. And you know, when, when you close your eyes, you you still see something, right? There's still illumination in a certain sense. Yeah, that's awareness. Awareness is a, we always hear the expression, you know, in the light of awareness. So there has to be some sort of light and awareness. Sometimes we've got to squint a little bit, but there's light and absolute <laughs> awareness. So when you're asleep, your consciousness lights up your your dream state, right? And you're yeah, you're in a big yeah. room. So 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 pretty much everybody agrees that everything we 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 see and perceive and is all created in some way. It's it's a it's made up. For for example, they know that the brain has to pull together the senses to make it into one unified experience on a slightly delayed basis because. You know, audio and visual stimuli and tactile stimuli come to us from one phenomena at different rates, so they have to get integrated, integrated to make sense to us. But yeah, in the hypnagogic state, it's more like you're viewing another world. Um, that's a possibility. But what your experience you just described to me is pretty typical of what are a wide range of contactee experiences, and and again, they're quite diverse, but they they all have that the quality you talk about, although the actual what how you describe what it is that you encountered varies from Bigfoot to what you just said. Yeah, 
I find myself every time that door opens for me, Ron, into a space of being very, very um, childlike. I'm very, very curious about that world so much. It gives me a fire to move into it. But every time that door opens, it's completely something new. It's a different vibration. It's a di different layer. It, have a, it has a different density, <laughs> a different tone. And so it's just this myriad of possibilities everywhere. And tonight, everyone, we're speaking about one of those possibilities, the alien nature of Bigfoot with my guest, Ron See, Maya, Ron, you said a little earlier you were going to give us a little more in-depth experience of the Bigfoot Singularity, your book that has come out recently. Yeah, it's it's a near-future science fiction book, and it begins when when a person who the, the lead character is autistic and he's very smart and he's he's in the he's a venture capitalist in the tech world. And he's trying to develop, like a lot of other people, artificial general intelligence. And his old mentor, who's who's a kind of a Russian oligarch, asked him to ask his artificial intelligence, what in the heck is Bigfoot? And the artificial intelligence replies that it's a biosynthetic learning device, like 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 he is the artificial intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, and that, and that piques his interest, so he gets. I lo I love I love that response myself. That was just so cool. <laughs> so this guy, because he's autistic, becomes obsessed with finding out what what the truth is behind this statement, and he starts connecting up with these organizations like the Bigfoot Research Organization. He finds one guy in the Upper Peninsula, of Michigan, which I use because I've been up there a lot, and it seems to be inappropriate, and it. And and there are, it turns out in the thing in the in the book that there's a couple of forces competing for whatever Bigfoot is and and <clears> one <throat> the Russian guy says oh this is cool technology alien technology and whoever gets their hands on it is going to be able to rule the world so to speak um, that's the basis behind most of cons conspiracy theory about alien technology is that there's technology there that will be a benefit to whoever can control it, which is why all the governments never exchange any information on their their alien projects based in the military. There's, there's another group of people who are kind of techie people who would like to destroy these. They think they're an evil force. And then there's our hero guy who's got a group of people around him, including na the Native Americans up in the peninsula, who want to assist them in their next evolutionary step, which is to create a new version of themselves. And the story unfolds in five days or four days as, as the, the Bigfoot clans have sent members to the Upper Peninsula to, they reproduce by sort of a 3D pr printing thing by entering a vortex and, and all the things that they've learned get formed into a new, a new creature, someone like Bigfoot who can, now may have new powers, you know, to time jump and do other things. Cloaking, cloaking's a big deal in the Bigfoot world. A lot of people see Bigfoot in cloak forms. Hear them walking by and you can't see them. Wow. Uh, carrying an orb. Uh, one of the, so, so, so anyhow, the, the gang, everybody's moving towards this big event where the, that's going to occur in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. These three forces, all to, one trying to make it happen and two to stop it in different ways. One to stop it, one to control it, which is sort of how we look at a lot of technology, right? Yeah, yeah. Use it to your advantage, don't accept it, or move it forward for the sake of science. So, And then it all comes together in kind of a battle in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and, and something happens. But you have to read the book to find out. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> wow! 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 Do you write a lot? Do you, is it a, is this a daily thing for you, or is just when you're in the groove or in the zone? And like I got a new book pumping through me. I'm gonna stay as often as I can. Or you, do you write just every day just to stay therapeutic? Or how does that work for you, bro? Well, some of it, I, since I'm producing stuff all the time, I write a lot of copy for the for the for the media that I'm doing so that I have to do it as work. But when I'm doing this sort of thing, I always write in the flow state. I have no idea what I'm going to do. 
is a problem I have no idea how it's going to solve. <laughs> yeah, right. and I, exactly. you know, it is. And I have to trust that, that that's going to happen. It's not very much an intellectual process. I, that's all I can say. It just it just happens. It comes up. And I'm fascinated because I have no idea how I'm going to do it. That's where the magic is in it, bro. I mean, it's like the, the ride that the ride that happens, the feelings that happen, the possibility that happens when we actually able to board that grace wrath. It's like I have no idea where this is going. It kind of feels cool to not be in control, not to sweat so much, and then things start moving. There's a momentum that begins to happen. It's pretty uh, ecstatic. Yeah, it's and and I can honestly say, I don't write the book. Me, <laughs> right. This, this this structure that's talking to you now is not the author of the book. And, it, and I mentioned to you, I do martial arts, and sometimes you throw or deal with somebody in a magical way, effortlessly. And I've had people experience that, and I've experienced it myself. And you say, well, how did you do it? And, and the real answer is, you didn't do that. I didn't do that. It just happened the way it needed to happen. It's a whole different experience. That's the flow experience. You know, I can back that up as a musician. I've been blessed, still pocket. blessed. I'm sorry? You get in the pocket. Oh, uh, yeah, and I play with some world-renowned players, drummer Hank Williams Jr., play, bass player for Starship. And so my point is bringing these people up, not to drop names, but to say that I'm able to play in this kind of energy. And when five of us, you know, after three songs, I, I usually run sound. So once I get all the mechanical stuff out the way, everything's sound checked, the lights are where they're supposed to be, and I take my shoes off and we get into that zone as a five-piece group, right? And that energy becomes hammering it out. And it's like, you know, we don't rehearse. We've been doing this for so long. We, we get into this song, and the drummer does something. And somehow, we've been doing this so long together subconsciously. We played all this riff that you could no one, you couldn't even create this out of band <laughs> rehearsal. It just, it just comes out and happens in this magnanimous way. And Ron, I can tell that you probably a guy. You don't stop, do you? You always engage. I mean, I'm not saying you don't take a weekend break, but you are in this to win it, right? Yeah, I win it, or I want to know about it. But, <laughs> but the other thing I notice is that you can't stay in it all the time. Haven't you noticed that? Yeah, it it gets too rich like cheesecake for me sometimes. And I mean that cheesecake is because it's so rich. It's like, you know, I got to get back to some abnormalcy, a normalcy, depending on what side of the fence a person's leaning on. But it, it, it gets kind of rich for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think the longest I've ever been in a an altered state like that, that you know, was not drug induced. It was probably about three days. <laughs> I, I was just so open, like I was with, with my daughter, young daughter, and we were shopping in a grocery store, and people would just come up and hug me, and she was like blown away. What in the heck's going on? But you know, there's when when I get in the zone, people get a sense that I see them for who they are, the truth of who they are, and that's very unusual for most people to have that experience because they want to be seen that way whatever their essence is i can kind of spot it at times but i can't stay there all the time yeah and i do the same thing a little differently when i go into a room i'm a social butterfly you know if, if you come to see one of my shows and we just go on break and i see you sitting there and you're enjoying yourself well one of my uh catchphrases or my ways of introducing myself is to sit down and grab some french fries out of your basket right and i start eating we just start having a conversation but what i do and i i do this quite often but now it's more of a default nature is when i meet someone for the first time I find something about them that is beautiful. The sound of their voice, a dialect, physical beauty. Someone's wearing a nice watch, a nice shirt. I find something and I use that to as my bridge, as to engage. And I start really following the rabbit, in, rabbit inside the whole of myself to where I, why do I find that particular thing or quality in that person beautiful? And I really start to go into that place and I really start to go in that place and I really start to go in that place. And I literally see, because I'm the one shifting, I literally see people heal and shift right before my very eyes. Terrific. Yeah, I've, I've had that experience when I've done these flow workshops. I mean, it, it can, in an hour, people, and I don't say I do this, I get them to totally change. You know, I went to, I came in and did a 
two-hour session with a bunch of people that were at a psychological treat. They were all screwed up and tight and tense and in themselves. And and the, the guy who was leaning it said, oh, they're... I said, well, these people have to touch each other in my exercises. Oh, they'll never do that. But by the end, they were all hugging and open. And- <laughs> <laughs> from the chat room, let me ask you a question, um, Ron, from the chat room. My friend Robert asked the question, and it's a pretty obvious question, but he asked, and I think it's an important question, a good question. So, do the, obviously the tribal people have more of an awareness on these creatures, Yeah. Native Americans, they're, they're really familiar. They probably had sit-downs and supper together, I mean, kind of thing. But so the, you would agree that the tribes, the, the Native Americans, they have more of a relationship. They seem to, without a doubt. They seem to be much more open to that magical aspect. There's a magical aspect to these encounters in, in a broad sense of magic. I don't mean like black magic or... Houdini magic, but there's a magical quality that you had when you were a kid that they're more open to. So yeah, and of course they all have these traditions of, of Bigfoot. Every one of every tribe. Can can I bring up one more thing just before we? Brother, this is your platform. I'm just enjoying the ride. So so one one of the one of the things I was looking for as I was looking at this idea of the 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 typical UFO unexplained aerial phenomena, as they're called now, and their relationship to Bigfoot is that early on, probably in the 70s, they began to review reports of people, places where where people had Bigfoot encounters in what you would call typical alien light orb type phenomena occurring together in one place. Have you heard about that? Quite often, yes. That many so, times there uh, there was a UFO, there would be a Bigfoot sighting, and or vice versa. Yeah, so what I wanted to do was to, in the movie, was to go to a few of these places where this was occurring or reported to be occurring and see what I could find with the camera and with the people there that were having these multiple experiences. And they're called paranormal hotspots, and uh, they're places where multiple paranormal paraphysical events are occurring over time not all at once you know in one hour or something in one geographical area and we went to dulce new mexico which is one of the earliest ones have you heard of dulce new mexico i have there was a supposedly an alien base there where aliens were exchanging technology with the american military it's on it's on an Apache reservation in the middle of nowhere. And we went down there to see what we could find. We were able to hire a father son native um, dual to to be our guides because you can't run around on the reservation without a permit. And they 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 are they are what they what you call the typical Bigfoot hunters. They had experiences themselves of the feeling of se- the sense of being watched or being under the observation of a higher presence, some unusual smells, but no direct visual contact. So they were both the father and son were very knowledgeable, more knowledgeable than me about Bigfoot and these encounters. And they took us around and we went on a Bigfoot hunt and nothing happened, which is pretty typical. Um, but we did, we did get to talk to a lot of Native people, and every one of them, an adult, had some experience, but they weren't going to go on camera. But finally, we found a guy who was sort of like the town crier, and people come to him with their experiences, and he related a few of them. Um, the, 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 the father was, a police, was the police chief, one of the police officers on the reservation for quite a while, so he responded to a lot of a lot of stories of, of contact and weird orbs and, and stuff like that. There's, there's one incident he described, which is quite interesting. Would you like to hear that? Absolutely. Uh, so there, there's an unusual quantity in the middle of nowhere of black helicopters and C-3 planes and people in military ops gear and everything running around that area for no good reason. 
I mean, it's not a tourist area. There's nothing there. It's, it's Native American land, which is usually the worst land in some ways. Um, one night he stopped a van that was speeding to the only main drag. And, and, the, and in driving in the van were um, two men fully decked out in paramilitary ops gear. And they told him, they, they told him to, um, he, he looked at the van. In the van was a cage. And um, he said he had never told anybody, only a couple of people about this incident. And they said to him, let us go <laughs> and don't tell anybody about this, which he did until recently. But he wouldn't tell me what was in the cage. <laughs> of course not. Somehow we, we 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 got we got we didn't we didn't film anything that was unusual or paranormal or paraphysical, um, so it was a bit of a disappointment. But it was cool to go down there and 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 hear the native pers the native perspective on this on these contacts. And, and like they all like you said, they all are pretty open to us. A lot of people found them scary. Others found them curious. Um, they're of the nature of lights that light up the valley, objects that came out of the Archuleta Mountain, and multiple Bigfoot encounters. And, of course, there are places where they say they can go see orbs every night. So orbs, Bigfoot, and an unidentified or unexplained area phenomena were occurring there according to them. You know? I, I, think, I, think, I think we're living in a place, time rather space right now that everything is crossfading everything is beginning to come together in this amalgamation is kind of like this um there's like this alchemical process beginning to happen what is that that which is emerging because of the fusion together of bigfoot humanity extraterrestrials humanity this veil is beginning to thin it's becoming so thin all these things are becoming known and people might say well you know these these things are occurring they've always been occurring the technology the spiritual technology rather the consciousness of the human being is beginning to expand so the veil is thinning big foot's coming out that's very Do good. You, yeah please please respond to that my friend so yeah that's that's sort of the conclusion I've come to. Uh, we, we went to this one place. Well, you, there, there's a link to the movie called Shape Shifting Bigfoot, where there's a place up there where this this guy has these this kind of tourist attraction where there's there's weird like ge um, gravitational phenomena that are hard to explain. But he thinks he's got four vortexes or five vortexes on his property. And he's able to take snapshots of uh, orbs. And he did that with, uh, they were around us. I didn't sense anything directly. But when we looked at the pictures he took and we were in the picture, there were these orbs coming, coming, growing in, in quantity until they kind of smothered us in the pictures in a, in a series of, in one second. But then, most interesting, he says he has a Bigfoot that he talks to regularly and lives there or shows up regularly. It doesn't live there, it shows up periodically. Like the orbs, they show up periodically. They're not, they're not there all the time. So in, in this, this little bit of footage from the movie, he was showing us in this house of mystery talking about the contact he has with his resident Bigfoot, so to speak. And when, he, and when he's saying that Bigfoot likes to come here and stand in this one spot and and this is where he likes to be. What showed up on the camera was this fairy moth-like creature that started near the camera, pure white, flew across, pretty much came right to the foot of Joe Hauser, the guy who was talking, flew up in front of him and over to my son-in-law who was standing in the back of the of the build of the structure, and then disappeared out of frame. And this occurred over Three, three seconds. So it was, it was quite a long period of time in some way. And listen, audience, I have seen that video. And if it's okay with you, Ron, can I retrieve that video now and drop it in this forum? Absolutely. So I'm what, get it. So what, you said you you saw that kind of creature before. Uh, you mean the fairy type creature? Yeah. 
<laughs> I seen one like that. I'm not sure it was the same creature because what I was introduced to walking with someone who was an alien human hybrid, befriending them for four years, 11 o'clock at night says, Keith, down the road, 50 feet on the right, I'm going to introduce you to a fairy. And he walks me up to this plant leaf, raise up the plant leaf, and there's a globule light about the size of a marble sitting there glowing. Um, I don't know if they're the same thing. I would say they would look alike. They both look very fairy-like to me. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is that, of course, you know, if we were capable enough, we could probably CG that in. But it's pure white. Um, the light is coming from the other direction. So if it were actually lit by sunlight, and you'll see in the frame how bright sunlight is. And this thing is as light, you know, sunlight bouncing off the floor. This is as bright or brighter on our scale than any natural light. And it would be backlit. So virtually impossible to for it to show up that way. And I can swear to you we didn't, you know, magically put it in there with CG. Um, and, and it showed up at the moment. When he was saying the Bigfoot likes to be here. And I'm dropping that link in the room as we speak. Please continue, sir. And and one of the one of the things about the one of the people who followed and spoke about it later said that that these paranormal creatures, since they're much smarter than us, they they have a sense of humor. So can you think of anything being more humorous than this giant supposedly eight foot primate showing up to us. <laughs> right. little white fairy. No joke. Absolutely. So that was something we got on film. Uh, but the, the most exciting place we went to was a, so that I would call that a paranormal hotspot. They were also supposedly uh, unexplained aerial phenomena that would come out of the overlooking Columbia Mountain. But we sat there at night and froze our butt off but didn't see anything. So they don't show up all the time. They don't show up on demand. And they usually don't show up for cameras <laughs> because they can avoid them if they want because they're so much smarter than us. I'm sure you have to be ready. If they're so self-aware, they would have to, if they're that self-aware, then they're definitely aware of your unawareness and saying, <laughs> one, you can't handle it. You're not yes. ready. It's not designed for you to. It was. It would shoot, uh, nudge you off of your path. So they have to have a full understanding of, you know, it could be something as simple as a light, a color of a light, or a harmonic that tells them, whatever the sense of knowing is for them, they would. Pro you would have to convince them that you're cool <laughs> to hang out. Yeah, exactly. So that's that. that what I found in the community of these people, that's called the habituation process. They habituate you slowly yeah, to their yeah. presence and gradually give you more and more if if you go in the right direction. So so again, they're all chosen. That's that's the conclusion. They choose you according to where you're at right now to see how the how you respond. So the final place hotspot we went to was a new one in outside of Eugene, Oregon, south of Eugene, Oregon, that appeared quite suddenly when um, a couple of, of guys found some what they thought were knee prints of, of, of Bigfoot and brought them back to this ordinary shed that was owned by a, an ex-contractor from, from Northern California who moved to this place to be near his grandchildren. He was Saul of the Earth guy and his wife the same way. And they started having multiple paranormal, paraphysical events occurring in in and around this garage he built, you know, metal garage, brand new. And every all the activity seemed to be coming out of one corner. And they got is, is the garage crazy. built run? Is the garage possibly built over something, or is it just happens to be located in the middle of a vortex kind of perimeter? The, the, the people thought both could be possible, but it seemed to be a doorway and an opening for creatures to come and go. And they did all the typical things. They played gifting games. Are you familiar with gifting games? Sure. You put something out and see what happens. You can play tic-tac-toe with these creatures. They seem <laughs> to drop out of the sky, play the game, and then disappear in the same way. They don't walk up. And they did... They have these devices where you 
get recordings, audio recordings of, of voices and other sounds that you don't hear when you're sitting there. I think they're called EFPs or something like that. You're familiar with that? Absolutely. Boy, yes. they, got so many, they got so many voices. On the day that the person who... EVPs, electro voice e phenomena. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm not a paranormal investigator, but yeah, they, they got some really strange ones. You can hear them in, in the movie. They also got the person's son, who the house they bought it for, committed suicide um, someplace else in the country. I don't know where. But on the day he committed suicide, they ha they got a, one of those recordings that said, I'm dead. Wow. And then they f found these chalky handprints stuck into the wall inside the house, little little handprints on the same night or day. Um, and they took pictures of them. You can see that. So you have ghost phenomena occurring there. You have these voices occurring. You have, have Bigfoot moving objects around and playing games with them. And then the other weird thing is that inside the shed, if you go outside at night and you put a recorder in there, it sounds like they're having a fight inside. They're whacking things and making noises and all sorts of crazy carries on. So the our deal was as as evening settled, we would see if we could if he could really we could capture this. They put a, a recorder inside the shed, big metal shed, and then we had a speaker outside. And at a certain point in time, he started. We started hearing some knockings. And so right away, we said, can we go in there and see if they will occur when we're inside? At least one person's inside. I went in there and nothing happened. Uh, but then my son-in-law, who's had multiple paranormal experiences, especially in relationship to Bigfoot, cloaking ones and other ones, he's in there with, his, with another camera with infrared and his own audio recording. And the knocking started occurring. And he's, so you can see he's looking around the, with his infrared camera, video camera. You don't see anything, but he gets all these sounds, and eventually he starts feeling the presence of something that emerged on that corner of the building, and he feels it twice, and these loud bangs are occurring, and there's no cause for it, physical cause. So he captured that. So I was happy. My friend, we are at the bottom of the show. we got a few minutes. Would you like to give out, would you please give out where we could find book, movie, all these things that you are plugged into and creating and help bring it about, as well as leave with, with a final thought, anything that you would like to see us uh, in the night with, sir? Yeah, so the book, you go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, um, or you can just go to Google, type in Bigfoot Singularity, and you'll get a, a variety of ways to buy the book, hard copy, download it and onto your Kindle. Uh, the movie is yet to be completed. We're in the final stages of post-production. But I can let you know when it's done. If you'd like to arrange for Absolutely. It, we maybe uh, do another show. Yeah, they could contact you. Or you could go to uh, the Bigfoot Chronicles trilogy, which is sort of the Facebook page for for um the book and contact me that we all know i'm not that skilled at uh, facebook communication but i'm trying to learn i think i just me. i just dropped the amazon link into the room everyone for the bigfoot singularity i wish i had this a little earlier could have been i might have dropped the ball but either way the amazon link to the book is there now sir thank you yeah. my, my, my thought is open up and you might have your own experiences don't be afraid of it. Be open to it. What else can you do? I mean, it's, you know, life is pretty boring if you don't have something that takes you outside of the comfortable normal box, right, bro? <laughs> but yeah, they, and, and they're, they're becoming more common everywhere across the world. Don't you agree? Can, absolutely. Can, Many can, different things are happening. I've, I've said when I vessled my first book, The Divine Principle, when, this book, Ron, was sort of like Conversations with God. But I was in meditation for eight years, communing, uh, communicating back and forth. And it's like, in this time period, this was in 1996, but in this period, obviously, just like he's saying, to support your point, to echo it, is that 
there are things happening right now we never thought possible. There are going to be all kinds of creatures more intelligent than us, some that deserve the title creature. They are coming through every possible portal, world, ship, ocean. <laughs> all this stuff is beginning to surface. Wouldn't you say so as well? Yeah? Absolutely. I think it's all one. In some ways, they're all one phenomenon and need to be looked at and studied that way. That's the conclusion I came to. Totally agree. They're not separate experiences. If they were, they would have been happening a long time ago. But they all seem to be happening all in this one time, and it's beginning to exponentiate. It's getting, what do they call that, the quickening? Things are truly turning within themselves. And it's like a biofeedback system. They begin to exponentiate, and the volume gets louder, and you keep that microphone in front of that speaker. It's going to create one hell of a noise. Yeah, some sort of singularity is another way of putting it. Absolutely. Leap in human consciousness that will extend to everybody. Ron, thank you, sir, for being a wonderful guest here on Center of Light Radio. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Good talking to you, bro. Same to you, man. Keep me posted. We'll get you back on, get into the thick, get into the zone. Just have some knuckleheaded guy fun, and everyone listening gets to chuckle at you and I. What do you think about that? <laughs> the messengers just don't kill us. Yeah, right. Bro, again, thank you, everyone. Center of Light Radio. My name is Keith Anthony Blanche. I really had a good time tonight with my guest, Ron C. Maya, the Bigfoot Singularity. I'm going to look more into it. I'm excited to know when the movie comes out. I'm curious to see his movie maker quality work, which I'm sure is phenomenal. I think on Center of Light Radio, yes, Sunday, Thursday night, Thursday night, 7 p.m., my guest is going to be Agi Nost. I have no idea what myself and his sexy European man is going to talk about, but he's very learned. He will keep you engaged. I really like me some Agi. Thursday night, Center of Light Radio, my name is Keith Anthony Blanchard. My son is living with me full time now, which I'm truly digging, loving all of it. So I'm picking my presentations and my radio interviews. A little more, little more choice in that. Why? Because that's what I want to do. Either way, tomorrow night I'm going to be doing a presentation. I think it's going to be a presentation on the subject of... Oh my God. Oh, hashtag you are loved beyond measure. I'll be seeing you soon. Everyone, Keith Anthony Blanchett, Center of Light Radio. Your love beyond measure. Peace, love, and light. Stick around. We're done, right? <laughs>